Howdy folks, welcome back to World of Tanks with the Mighty Jingles, and it's been a while since I did a proper tank review for you, so uh, here's a proper tank review, and I bet you didn't see this one coming. The WZ-132 Chinese Tier 8 Light Tank. One of only two Tier 8 Light Tanks in the game, the Chinese get this, and the other one of course being the very, very dangerous French AMX 1390. And I do love the AMX 1390, I've had some great games in it, but I'm really starting to develop a soft spot for the 132. This is a fantastic little tank. Um, the stats on the thing are pretty darn impressive. 1,050 hit points. It's a light tank, it's never going to have a lot of health, but it can take a few hits. It only weighs 24.56 tonnes, of a maximum of 26.5 tonnes, and it has a 520 horsepower engine. That means this little thing produces a power to weight ratio of 21.17 horsepower per tonne of the tank, which is really, really good. Also, the manoeuvrability is just amazing. It will do 50, uh, 64 kilometres per hour. It's very fast, and it turns at 56 degrees per second. Now, one of the things about the suspension of tanks in World of Tanks that isn't obvious from just mousing over the suspension stats, it tells you that it'll uh, the load limit, the amount of weight the suspension can carry, the traverse speed and how much it weighs, but what it will not tell you is the ground resistance. Ground resistance is actually broken into three different categories. You have hard terrain resistance, you have medium terrain resistance and you have soft terrain resistance, depending on the type of ground you're moving over. If you were to compare the WZ-132 to another tank in the game that has fantastic off-road performance and was designed to have fantastic off-road performance, the German Tier 10 medium tank, the Leopard 1, you'd find that in all three categories, hard, medium and soft terrain resistance, the WZ-132 is 30% better in every category. This thing moves like a rocket off-road, and it really does need to, because it has absolutely no armour whatsoever. 55mm is the most you're going to get, and that's at the front of the turret. The armour on this thing is purely there to stop the crew from falling out. <laughs> um, you, you, you are, I'm not going to say you are never going to bounce a shot fired at you in this thing, you know, anything can happen, but if you're relying on the armour of this thing to keep you safe, you're definitely doing it wrong. Now, what's going to keep you alive when you're driving this thing is the c a combination of the insane mobility and the tank's camo rating. Now, the special thing about light tanks in World of Tanks is that they retain their camo rating while they're moving. They're the only class of vehicle in the game that does so. The WZ-132 has a base camo rating of just a fraction under 20%, and that's a base camo rating, that's without taking into account the crew's camo skill as well. What that means, that 20% is how much of a percentage of the enemy tank's vision that you negate while driving and being stationary in this tank. So, for example, if an M46 Patton is trying to spot you with, a four, with his 400 meter view range, just by virtue of being in this tank, you reduce his effective vision range down to 320 meters for the purposes of him trying to spot you. And then, of course, you train camo on this thing as well, and it reduces it even further. And that's why so many light tanks are so incredibly hard to detect if they're driven properly. Now, of course, that camo bonus is good while you're stationary and while you're moving but not when you're firing. The camo rating of this tank drops down to around 7% when you fire the gun, and I think for up to 5 seconds after you've fired the gun. I'm not certain of the exact number, but it's no more than 5 seconds, and possibly as little as 3 seconds, but anything between 3 to 5 seconds after you've fired the gun, you have to wait for your camo value to reassert itself. And this gets a lot of light tank drivers into trouble because they'll, they'll park themselves behind, for example, if on the steps map, there's a rock in the middle of the field with a bush to one side of it, and you can park yourself up behind that bush and spot most of the enemy team moving along the flank to where the cap circle is, for example, on uh, encounter mode on steps. And, uh, and, you know, you spot a lot of targets when you're sitting there, but the second you pull the trigger, camera rating drops, suddenly you appear on their radar, 
they all turn around and start shooting at you. If you're going to be firing from cover in a light tank while spotting targets, unless you're 100% positive that they're still out of effective view range even after you've fired the gun, you need to pull back and get into solid cover. And not doing that gets a lot of light tank drivers killed. Taking all of these stats into consideration, along with the 48 degrees per second turret traverse, which again is very, very good, the fact that the tank will do 64 kilometers per hour, that has a blistering 56 degree per second traverse speed, a very quick 48 degree per second turret traverse, the phenomenal off-road performance which allows this tank to maneuver at high speed on all different kinds of terrain, this tank is a very, very good little dogfighter. So let's take a look at the research tree and check the guns out while we're there. The 132 actually has a very interesting research tree. For a start, you're already going to have the radio unlocked. Um, you can unlock that radio, and you should have unlocked that radio at tier 7 on the 131. The engine is difficult to recommend for a number of reasons. Now, for a start, it's you're only going to use this engine on the 132. It's not as if you can unlock that engine and then have it unlocked on the 120. The 120 doesn't use it. This is the only tank in the game that uses that engine. And a lot of people will, will find themselves in this sort of circumstance when they're looking at what to upgrade and unlock on a tank. They'll think, well, if I'm not going to use that engine on, on any other tank, uh, I'll just not unlock it, and I'll just you know play with the stock engine. Ordinarily, I would recommend against that on a light tank, especially like the 132, that lives and dies on its speed maneuverability. You know, If there's a better engine upgrade available for a tank, then take that engine upgrade. However, check this out. The stock engine has exactly the same horsepower as the upgraded engine. They're both 520 horsepower engines. They both have 12% chance of fire and impact. The only thing you get out of the upgraded engine is 10 kilos less weight. That makes it very, very hard indeed to recommend spending XP on the engine upgrade of the WZ-132. In fact, that if you're going to elite the tank, that's the only reason you would want to spend 10,500 research points on that engine. It's going, to, it's going to be the last thing you want to upgrade on this machine. Now, when we turn to the guns, again, it's an interesting situation. The stock gun, well, you should already have two of these guns unlocked. The stock gun, obviously, but also this 100mm. That gun you can unlock on the WZ-131, but you don't have to. It sits here. So in order to get to the 132 from the 131, you only have to go through this 85mm gun. And again, this is one of those things, unless you're, going to unl um, unless you're going to elite the previous tank, a lot of people will skip that gun, and they will just go straight to the next tank in the line. And normally I tell people, well, yeah, that's a bad idea, because you're going to want this gun because it's going to make the pain and grind on the next tank a lot easier, because you can equip that gun straight away. And you can do that on the 132. There it is. You don't require this turret to use that gun. However there is an alternative. And again, it's another one of those optional, not necessary upgrades. It's this 85mm gun. That gun will cost you 16,500 XP. You will already have this 100mm gun unlocked. Let's compare the stats of the two. You're going to be using one of these two guns to grind out the XP you need for the turret and the top 100mm. And this 85mm doesn't compare too badly. Um, it's got a much faster aiming time, 2.3 seconds versus 2.7 seconds. It's much more accurate, 0.34 versus 0.39. The damage obviously isn't as good, 200 versus 250. The penetration isn't as good, but it's not that much worse, 172 versus 181. And the rate of fire is nearly double, 10.91 rounds per minute versus 6.74. For me, what sealed the deal on choosing between these two guns was that aiming time, 2.3 seconds. The 2.7 second aiming time is pretty bad. 2.3 is pretty good, and on a light tank that really doesn't want to be sitting around exposed, waiting for the sights to settle on a target, and just inviting everybody to return fire at you, with your 55mm of armour at the most on the front of your turret, 
aiming time can be the difference between life and death. So while this gun is certainly not required in order to get to the top gun or even to the next tank, I would recommend you unlock it and use it anyway. Although the 100mm works as well. The choice is entirely yours. All I can do is give you the information, you know, and, and you can make your own mind up. Whichever gun you're going to choose to grind out the XP on this tank to unlock the turret, the turret's going to set you back 15,000 XP. This gun, 45,000 XP. It's an expensive gun to research, and you don't have to unlock it. You don't even have to unlock the turret to get to the WZ120. But you're going to want to get this gun because you use it on the WZ120 at tier 9. And it's not a bad gun at all. 7.06 rounds per minute, 189 penetration, 244 with APCR ammo. Or is it? Actually, yep it is. APCR ammo. Wasn't sure whether or not it was high explosive anti-tank. High explosive anti-tank would have more penetration than that. Uh, 250 damage. 0.36 accuracy, and again, it's got that 2.3 second aiming time. So you really do want, if you're serious about driving the 132, you want that 100mm gun, even though it's going to cost you 45,000 XP. The only real decision on this tank is which gun you're going to use to grind out that 100mm. This 85mm, which I would recommend, but this 100mm works as well, and you will already have it unlocked. And finally, of course, it also has a 400m view range, which is very, very good and a 750 meter signal range. As far as crew skills go, it's a light tank. Camo, 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 and camo. Don't forget that 20% base camo rating is with zero camo on the crew as well. Training camo on the crew also adds to the range at which you will not be detected while moving, because it's a light tank. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. Camo is fantastic for light tank drivers, especially tier 8 light tank drivers that find themselves in tier 10 games all the time. Of course, as soon as your commander reaches 100%, you're going to want to swap camo for 6th sense. I so wish I had 6th sense on this thing. I really, really do. Um, just knowing when you've been spotted is so much better than just thinking you might have been spotted. 6th <laughs> sense is an amazing skill to have but particularly for light tank drivers. Equipment. Well, did I mention camo? You're going to want to get a camo net for this thing. That would be my recommendation anyway. I've also gone with binocular telescopes because this is a tier 8 light tank and you're constantly getting into tier 10 games. And it's, you know, it's great being able to run around and do damage. But in order to do that successfully and not die immediately in a light tank, you need the enemy team to have started taking damage, losing tanks, taking hits, so that you can get around the flanks, which you can absolutely do with the mobility of this thing, of isolated enemy tanks, because it's very, very difficult to take down an, isol uh, well, an unisolated enemy heavy tank when all of his friends are shooting at you, and trust me, Anybody sees a light tank on the battlefield, they think easy kill and they will immediately switch fire and start shooting at you. So not being seen until you are ready to be seen is key to survival driving these things. For that reason, camo net, and since you're not going to be doing an awful lot in the first half of the game until things have settled down and you're ready to make your move, you may as well make yourself useful and fit a binocular telescope. Your third crew skill, uh, not crew skill, sorry, your third equipment module is entirely personal preference. I play this thing as a dedicated scout rather than a damage dealer. So I have gone with improved ventilation just to improve the camo rating even further, the view range even further, and so on and so on and so on. If you're feeling slightly more aggressive, um, coated optics, not a terrible idea. If you spend a lot of time on the move in this thing, depends how you do your scouting. Uh, I tend to play it more passively. There's absolutely nothing wrong with playing this thing as an aggressive, active scout. If you're going to do that, coated optics. You may also wish to play the thing as a light attack tank, the way a lot of people do the AMX 1390 and have a lot of success, in which case you're going to want a medium caliber tank gun rammer. Choose your third equipment slot entirely dependent on how you think you're going to play the tank. Speaking of playing the tank, let's have a few games. 
You get your little scout tank into a game like this. It's a tier 10 match on Etsk, where there is very little opportunity for scouting. There is no artillery for you to go hunting. You very, very definitely much have to try to just keep yourself alive. Until later in the game. When you can do something useful. Especially if, like me, you've set this thing up as a, as a dedicated scout and you don't have a gun rammer. And it's a lot like driving a French autoloader. And the, you know what it's like when you drive it. Light tank drivers will know exactly what I'm talking about. If a bunch of enemy tank destroyers are lying in ambush and they see two heavies, a medium and a light tank come charging around a corner, every one of them is going to shoot at the light tank first, because people love kills regardless of how ineffective that fire may be. So you really do have to marshal your health, keep yourself safe. Wow. I'm amazed he didn't put a shot into me when he came around the corner. Although well, possibly he was more concerned about trying to run away. And it's at moments like this, when the enemy team are definitely on the back foot Especially on a map like Ensk. When you can actually, you know, do something. Oh, took a hit there. This thing's fast, but it ain't that fast. T-57 Heavy. Dangerous machine. While he's distracted. Jump in there. Take his tracks off. And all of the remaining damage done to that T-57 Heavy by the rest of my team. I get a share of their XP and credits. And that's how you need to drive this thing. When you're in this kind of situation, it's a tier 10 match, you're on Ensk. Scouting opportunities are very, very limited. You have to play it like a, a scavenger. Look after your health. Do what damage you can, where you can. And even if you're going up against tier 10 heavy tanks and you haven't got a hope of penetrating them, you can still help your team out by going for the track shots, immobilizing them. Keeps them pinned in place, makes them an easier target for your team. They can't angle their armor effectively. Your team will kill them if you help them to do it. And thanks to the spotting and tracking damage mechanics in World of Tanks, it pays off. So, spotting mechanics. It can be a little tricky for people to get their heads around, but the 132 has 400 meters of view range. Binoculars add 25% to that when the vehicle's stationary, which means 500 meters of view range, but no tank in World of Tanks can spot something at 500 meters. So you may be thinking, well, it's a waste of time then, surely? Well, yes and no. This, by the way, is another fantastic spotting position here on Muravanka, as you're going to see. Look at this lot. And again, the trick is not pulling the trigger, regardless of how tempting it might be. Let your team do the damage, and you take a percentage of all of their XP and credits for the damage that they do to the targets that you have spotted while they're shooting at them. So I was talking about how uh, spotting range, Oh, and I was very very concerned that this object 704 was going to get me killed <laughs> by all the tanks shooting at him and hitting me, but I did get away with it. So uh, yeah, view range. I think the maximum effective spotting range in World Attacks, and I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but I'll make sure I edit it in a pop-up over the screen after I find out uh, after I've recorded this replay. Take your shot, back off, because they will have spotted me. Remember, my uh, camo rating 
drops by 75% when I fire the gun. Pop off their radar, how do I know I popped off their radar? They all popped off mine. Then it's safe to move back up. So, while you cannot spot an enemy vehicle, regardless of how good your view range is, if that enemy vehicle is more than 455, I think, but I'll amend that when I find out the exact figure, meters away from you, don't forget, stacking view range is not a bad thing, because these tanks also have modifiers which affect the range at which you can detect them. They have their own camo rating. There could be a line of scrub and, and you know, concealment between you and them, which is going to further reduce the range at which they can be spotted. So your view range and their camo rating are constantly fighting against each other to determine the range at which you can spot them. So while you might think using binocular telescopes to boost your effective view range to 500 meters is a waste of time because you can't spot anybody at that range anyway, don't forget you're constantly trying to fight a battle against their camo rating. And I don't like the angle that Centurion's at. He might be able to spot the side of my tank through that bush. And I don't have sixth sense, so better safe than sorry. Yep, I've been spotted. T95's taken a pot shot at me. Let's get back. Wait. There we go. He disappeared. Which means it's safe for me to pop back up and resume spotting duties. Unfortunately, and this is the curse of being a light tank driver, you can spot all of the targets you like, but if your team are incapable of killing them, it's really hard to carry a game in a light tank. You can lead the horse to water, but you just cannot make it drink. And this team was pretty hopeless. So, screw it, let's go and get some damage done. And even without a gun rammer... And yes, I did just take a hit in the side from a T95 <laughs> and survive it, but yeah, I'm not getting out of this one. So that game was actually pretty terrible. Unfortunately, you know, you can light up all the targets in the world, but if your team are not good enough to actually kill them, you're wasting your time. And, and this is why it's... People who exclusively drive light tanks can be the best tank drivers in the world, but their win rating, <laughs> more than any other kind of tank driver in World of Tanks, is almost entirely dependent on how good the rest of their team is at taking advantage of the good work that light tank drivers do in lighting up targets for them. If you've been driving light tanks in World of Tanks for any length of time, and you don't just die uselessly in the first minute of each game you play, you're going to have become intimately familiar with all those little spots on the map where you can hide spot the enemy team. This is the obvious one on steps. And there it is paying off. Now the trick is not pulling the trigger, regardless of how much the temptation to do so tries to overpower your trigger finger. Remember, you are invisible until you pull the trigger. Unfortunately, there's only one, and you'll never hear me say this again. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is only one artillery on each side in this game. So there was not that great an opportunity for me to clock up a lot of spotting damage. Artillery did what he could, but he can only fire so often. It's tier 10 artillery. 
Now, I'm not saying that you should never fire when you're in this kind of position. <laughs> Look at chat there. <laughs> oh, Yagpanzeri 100 jingles for president. Yeah, I'm not saying you should never fire when you're sitting in this position. But if you do fire and you don't have sixth sense, in fact, even if you do have sixth sense, ooh, they need to kill that guy. I don't want to get spotted here. Even if you do have sixth sense, sixth sense takes three seconds to kick in and alert you that you've been spotted. And there's a lot of tanks in the game that have an aiming time substantially less than three seconds. So if you are going to pull the trigger when you're in this kind of position, you need to have somewhere to retreat to where you're going to be safe from return fire. That's why this spot on steps is fantastic. Your left flank is protected from enemy tanks over there where the cap circle would be if this was in counter. Simply by driving backwards, you drop below the lie of land and they don't have a direct line of fire on you. Your right flank is protected by that rocky outcrop that you're sheltering behind. And I don't generally play this tank when I'm platooned with, you know, anybody. Light tanks are... Well, they don't work that well in platoons. Particularly a tier 8 light tank like the 132, you have to count on getting into tier 10 games. So if the other guys in your platoon aren't going to play light tanks, they have to plan accordingly and pick a tank that can handle itself in a tier 10 match. And platoons of light tanks... No, generally not a very good idea. Oh, artillery. Okay, I am going to take this shot. And then I'm going to get the hell back. He's gone. You'll note I'm platooned up here with circumflexes and high fly 15 on one of those rare occasions where I do platoon up when I'm driving a light tank. And I was feeling a considerable amount of uh, performance anxiety in this game because high fly 15 is a fantastic light tank driver. So I felt like I was being judged <laughs> all the way through this game. Now you know, as soon as I fired, I pulled back into cover behind the rock, counted to six, takes five seconds for your camo value to reassert itself and for you to drop off the enemy map. So count to six just to be on the safe side before popping back out into cover. And now, figure it's safe to make a move and start picking off isolated enemy tanks. I know there's a T110E4 just up there. There he is. Yeah, first shot went high. Hit a bump in the ground. Now, it's always useful to go for his tracks, but... Ah! <laughs> no! Oh no, no, don't shoot me, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. Unbelievably, I don't know how much health the tracks of the T110E4 have got, but they had enough to take that 100mm shell without falling off. But, we've got him. Yeah. And we're being capped. So, I'm not going to go chasing down that object 268. Juicy target though he may be. I'm in the fastest tank on my team. I'm going to head back and try to help reset that cap. Although, we've got people closing in on them from the left and the right. They probably don't need my help. But, two IS-7s. And there's an E-100 over there somewhere as well. Okay, one IS-7's dead. Yeah, they can put up some stiff resistance. Oh, there's the E100. Oh, shit. Fired on the move. Did not expect it to penetrate, but he was there. My gun was loaded. And he wants me bad. <laughs> he really, really wants me dead. And he's just nailed high flyers 4502. Tried to blow his tracks off, but again, just didn't do enough damage. In fact, I think it might have bounced off his lower glaciers. Oh, come on, guys, kill him, kill him! <laughs> no, no, he's going to get the gun. Ah, oh, shit. 
Oh well. It was fun anyway. Come on. Oh right, now you finish him off. Oh, thanks for nothing, guys. But there you go, as an example, um, showing one particular very, very good spotting position on steps. Uh, so, you know, even though we only had the one artillery, we had tanks behind me who were taking full advantage of getting in position and putting down harassing fire on all those guys that I lit up, moving out of the enemy base over to the eastern flank of the map. Bagged myself a T-110E4 and, and failed utterly <laughs> at trying to circle strafe. an E-100 of all the tanks in the game. Oh, I can't believe it. For shame, Jingles, for shame. So, that wasn't too bad. But I've had a much, much better game than that. WZ132 on Malinovka, tier 9 game. Generous matchmaking, not that many tier 9s. And it's Malinovka. This is a fantastic map for this kind of tank. Especially if you've got it set up as a dedicated spotting scout tank. Now, there are two bushes across the lake on Malinovka that are fantastic for spotting and lighting up the enemy team. One of them is a bit more dangerous than the other one. I'm going to go for that one. Take a pot shot of that 59-16. Yeah, I really wish we'd been able to kill this guy. Because he's going to make my life very, very difficult. On my left, I'm just passing the first bush, which is safer, but doesn't give you as many spotting opportunities. This pair of bushes up here is more dangerous, and if that 5916 over there had died, I would have been able to get away with this. So that's a pretty terrible start. I'm down to 365 health. Been hit by a Pershing, a Leopard prototype, and probably the 5916 too. And artillery's taken a pot shot at me because you know how much artillery loves light tanks. I'm thinking about trying to pop back up to that bush, but no. That 5916 must have spotted me. He'll be sitting there, down in the swamp, tucked in in the bushes, trying to spot anybody coming across this field. So instead, back up, stay out of line of sight, in the low ground, plan my approach. And I'm going to have to spot from here, from now on. And there you go. Camo net and binoculars back up. And we're going to start lighting the targets up. All credit to the 5916 tank driver. He did a good job. He was unlucky to get spotted initially, but he's down there in those bushes somewhere. Ruining my day. Doing a good job. And now we just have to be patient. I'm not very good at being patient. <laughs> it took me a long, long time to get used to passive scouting. Oh, hello. I've took the shot. I need to back off. He will have seen me. Let the prototypes have a good view range. Everybody else up there with him has, well, will definitely be able to pinpoint my position from firing that shot. Now, I'm not going to shoot here unless I have to. However, I do need to reposition because he's gotten too far around the flank. He's going to spot me from the side. So I'll take the shot and I'm still lighting him up. My team hammered the crap out of him and I got the kill. And wait, don't pop back up into the bush. Dead tanks can continue to spot you for a couple of seconds after they've died. So wait for it, wait for it. You need to drop off the map so they can no longer see you on the radar. And they won't spot you through the bush when you move back up. And there's another one. AMX 5100. Gun depression means I can only shoot at his turret, but I, I get the shot, and again, don't take the chance that you haven't been spotted. 
if you think you may have been spotted, especially when you only have 365 health and 55 millimeters of armor, back off. Pop up, spot them, risk a shot at the comet. Pretty bad gun depression on this tank, in common with most Chinese tanks. I hit him, didn't kill him. Type 59 hit my ammo rack. Very lucky to still be driving the tank. I can no longer afford to take any chances. And this Conqueror, I mean... <laughs> wow. Just... Really? <laughs> well, okay. If, um, no, I don't know either. But he's dead. I now have two kills. And I'm not. And again, the Conqueror will still be lighting me up, so you need to wait. And then move up to your position. Comet's dead. And here comes a Super Pershing. Now, not the only Pershing. I'll take a shot at this guy and back off, because the Super Pershing will now be able to see me. I fired the gun. I've lost a lot of camo rating. The Pershing's backed off, the Type 59's taken hits. I really need to light that Super Pershing up again. And there he is. And he can't see me from here, or he would be pointing the gun at me. So I'm going to try and blow his tracks off. There we go, he's been tracked. I'm not entirely certain whether or not I was the one who tracked him. He did take a big hit just before I fired. But I was definitely spotting him. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to shoot him. And now he's dead as well. So we're winning 8-3. I mean, we, we've definitely got this one in the bag. But I'm a one-shot kill for everything in the game at this point, And I really would like to survive this match. I don't survive many games I play in this tank. Oh, missed that one. Back off. Use the manoeuvrability and the speed of this little tank to keep yourself safe from return fire when you're taking these opportunistic shots. SU-152 would be a juicy kill, but he's behind a rock. Pershing just popped back up on the radar, but I know he's around the corner of the uh, outcrop there. I don't have a shot at him. Got to be careful when you're driving this tank. The, the gun depression to the front is pretty bad. And when you're trying to get the gun down on the target, it's very, very easy to drive too far forward and end up poking out of cover and revealing yourself to enemy tanks. Our T-54s nailed their Carnarvon. So, I figure now is... Oh, this is... Uh, okay. Shot on the move. Take out the Pershing and get my ass down into low ground. Took my tracks off. But I'm safe. It's not just the Pershing that we could see. It was a problem. There he is. There was an AMX 5100 up there as well. The Pershing didn't have that good a shot at me, but... The 5100 might have. Anyway, now he's dead. Got myself into cover. Take advantage of all the concealment you can. Pershing's still down there. There he is. And I've lit him up again. And now he's in all kinds of trouble. Move forward to get a shot. He's not pointing his gun at me. Take your shot. Get back. Let the E75 and the IS-3 finish him off. I detected him. I'm getting a share of everything they earned for killing him. E75 at long range, but the side of his turret I could have penetrated, but yeah, it went wide and it bounced off his gun. Screw the E75, he's got his own problems, he's dead. Now we need to find their artillery. Come on, little scumbag, where are you? Although, to be fair, this guy went down fighting, so he's not a scumbag. He fought with honour. And of course, you know the rules. Jingles is not allowed to kill artillery. <laughs> but I am allowed to blow his tracks off. So, not a bad result. Um, 41,000 credits, 3,000 XP, doubled for the first win of the day. Um, I didn't get to spot as many targets as I would have liked. If I'd been able to make it and stay without being detected in the first bush that I moved to, uh, I would have had a better game, no question about it. But that enemy 5916 was in a very aggressive spotting position in the swamp, 
He lit me up, and I, that position was untenable. I had to pull back, move back to the second bush, uh, where it was a lot safer. Of course, the downside is you're not quite forward enough to get lots and lots of good spots on enemy tanks moving up the hill, but good enough. As you can see, we spotted five tanks. Um, spotting damage there, 268 to the Conqueror, 381 to the Leopard. It all adds up. That Super Persian got hammered, thanks to us. 440 direct damage from my spotting him, and 773 direct damage as he was immobilised. After I'd shot his tracks off, the Type 59, 429 to him, and yeah, the artillery only had 39 health left when I blew his tracks off, so 39 to him as well. But it all adds up. And uh, sorted by XP earned combination of the damage that I did myself and all of the spotting damage that I inflicted on the enemy team put me at the top of the list 1032 XP and and I didn't do too badly on damage either came third it's not bad in a tier 8 light tank in a tier 9 game so there 2087 damage done 1180 potential damage received from only four hits you, you cannot afford to be getting shot at when you drive one of these little things taking fire is the game's way of telling you you're doing it wrong when you're in a light tank. And of course 2,330 uh, spotting damage as well, so not a bad little game at all. So, WZ-132. Um, I think this is a fantastic little light tank. It, easily as good as the AMX 1390. It's just so quick and mobile. Uh, and it's a better dogfighting tank than the AMX 1390 because it just turns so much faster. That's always been the the Achilles heel of the AMX 1390 for me. It's a fantastic little tank, but it turns very sluggishly. A lot of the French tanks do. The Batchat has the same problem. Fantastic in a straight line, just don't ask it to turn any corners. It drives like an American muscle car. <laughs> the 1390 kind of suffers from the same problem in comparison to other light tanks, whereas the WZ-132, definitely not. This thing turns on a dime. Um, and I like it a lot more than I liked the other Chinese light tanks leading up to this. I mean, the, the 5916 is pretty bad. Um, it's, it's not very good. It can be fun, but it's not very good. The WZ-131 wasn't bad at all. I had fun driving this tank, even if I didn't do particularly well in it. It is a fun tank to drive. But it wasn't until I got to the WZ-132, where I'm having fun and I'm doing well. Um, it, I just really, really like this tank. And if you, you know, it's difficult to recommend light tanks to everybody, because some people just don't like driving light tanks. It's definitely different to driving any other class of tank in the game. Uh, and I'm not a particularly good light tank driver, but I do have fun driving them. And this is one of those light tanks that, for one reason or another, I'm able to not just have fun, but also to do relatively well in it. So, if you like what you've seen, I can definitely recommend the Chinese Tier 8 light tank, the WZ-132, one of only two Tier 8 light tanks currently in the game, along with the French AMX 1390. They're both fantastic, they're both a lot of fun, they're both very dangerous little tanks. As always, folks, take care on that battlefield, and I'll catch you next time.